Like so many industries, the music business has been dramatically transformed by the digital revolution. The top-selling album of 1999, The Backstreet Boys' Millennium, sold more than 30 million copies around the world. Last year's number one, The Greatest Showman motion picture cast recording, sold just 3.5 million. While musicians are making far less from direct sales of their music, there are other ways for successful artists to make a living. NewsHour Weekend's Christopher Brooker has the story. Even if you have not set foot in a record store in 20 years, you have invariably heard the music of Spoon in commercials, on television, in movies, or maybe even during presidential candidate Pete Buttigieg's debate warm-up. Few bands have navigated the profound digital disruption of the music industry quite as well as Spoon. Their story is a testament to the new realities of what it means to be a successful band. Founded in 1993 by singer and songwriter Britt Daniel and drummer Jim Eno, Spoon's story almost stopped as it was starting. The band was famously dropped by Elektra Records in 1998, but rather than calling it quits, they kept going, recording on their own without a label. Once a week, I would call my manager and lawyer and say, anybody want to put out that record? And they were like, no, why don't you think about changing the band name or you know, starting a new band? And so it really probably made more sense for us to start over. But in hindsight, it didn't. Merge Records, an independent label based in Durham, North Carolina, released Girls Can Tell in 2001. It sold more copies than both their previous records combined. What followed has been a near 20-year run of commercial success and critical acclaim. But Spoon's path was markedly different than that of those who have come before. 1999, the year after the band was dropped, was the high watermark of the music industry of old. Adjusted for inflation, it made nearly $22 billion in retail revenue. Last year, it was just under $10 billion. The story is familiar by now. The advent of digital technology, everything from Napster, iTunes, Spotify, and Pandora, changed the economic landscape of music. The word is out that there's not really a lot of money made on making records anymore. There's money made at the very, very top, you know. But uh, it's, not, it's certainly not the same thing as when we started. Time's gone inside out. Radio has changed as well. Consolidation and the closure of college radio stations have decreased the number of avenues for independent artists like Spoon to make it on the airwaves. So Daniel says the band had to think differently about how to forge a career. There was not that avenue for exposure and, and we weren't getting paid a lot of money and so if someone wanted to give us $5,000 to put a song on a TV show, that seems like a good deal. While Spoon's licensing list is as lengthy as the end credits of a feature film, it's reflective of a broader shift in attitudes towards licensing music. But it's not as if Spoon forged entirely new ground. This Rice Krispies jingle from the early 60s comes by way of a very young Rolling Stones. Rice Krispies. Still, there was once a fierce debate about whether it was okay for a serious musician to license their music this way. Lou Reed was widely criticized for allowing Walk on the Wild Side to be used in this mid-80s Honda scooter campaign. Hey, don't settle for Walk. But a quick dive into YouTube reveals Reed was far from alone, and many more have at one time or another licensed their music for advertisements, television, and movies, something that was famously criticized by Neil Young in his 1988 song, This Note's For You. His song, released right around the time George, Paul, and Ringo were suing Nike over its use of the Beatles song, Revolution. Paul McCartney explained his position in this 1989 interview. We never did do commercials with the Beatles. We had lots of big offers from soft drinks companies, you know, to do stuff, obviously, but we always thought, no, it kind of spoils it. Just takes that little edge off it. This feeling did not extend to McCartney's solo work. He teamed up with Visa just a year later to promote his world tour. And recently, he allowed his song Great Day to be used in an advertisement for a credit card. To enjoy. I'm sorry, but as a filmmaker, I have to face the truth. I'll turn my camera on. 
Daniel says despite the wide use of Spoon's material, it has not impacted the band's approach. Was there a, a initial conversation about where your music goes and what it's licensed to? Oh yeah, we, we gotta approve every one of them. You know, we don't write the songs for those uses. The album still means something. It is a moment and you will never be able to write songs exactly like you did during that moment when that album was made. When we first started it out, I was writing songs to, to, that'll go over well in bars, you know? And so when we started Spoon, that was sort of like, that was the big goal, get that weekend gig at a better place. Spoon spent the past summer on the road, supporting the release of their greatest hits album, Everything Hits at Once. Proof enough that in the new music economy, while money from licensing is nice, it's the gigs that pay the bills. What advice do you give bands that are 20 years younger? Every now and then I will get uh, an artist that says, how did you do what you do? And I, I usually tell them to do it for yourself, to do it locally, to make, to make and be in your own scene, and then other things will come to you.